Coming up on Market to Market. How low can it go? Price declines leave the oil industry in limbo. President Obama cries foul on his status as a lame duck. And another commodities downturn tugs at the fiber of rural America. Those stories and market analysis with Don Rose next. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com. This is the Friday, January 15 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Mike Pearson. With the global economy in turmoil, the world's largest retailer, Walmart, said it will shutter 269 stores, more than half of which are in the U.S. Closer to home, the Commerce Department announced retail sales dipped one-tenth of a percent last month. At the wholesale level, producer prices fell two-tenths of a percent in December, capping an overall decline throughout 2015. And Bank of America Merrill Lynch stated roughly 90 percent of U.S. companies report earnings on an adjusted basis, muddying the waters for investors in search of real value. Wall Street teeter-tottered this week, spurred by the specter of China and energy's drop. The Dow gave up over 300 points early on, followed by a midweek rally, but gains retreated back into the red Friday. Crude oil hit 12-year lows despite a midweek rebound, leading some to theorize a bottom for black gold had finally been found. But hopes were dashed when oil dropped below the $30 benchmark to finish the week. Traders see no indication of a near-term resolution of the global oil glut. Investment firms have warned prices could dive to just above $10 per barrel. OPEC's strategy to flood the market and push higher-cost domestic producers out has backfired so far. Domestic oil production has jumped 72 percent since President Obama took office. The translation to lower fuel costs has benefited farmers and consumers. And in his final State of the Union address this week, the commander-in-chief hinted his swan song will put the pedal to the metal. The president delivered his final State of the Union this week, laying out a plan for his final year in office. One of Obama's priorities will be building a global coalition that he says will be helpful in diffusing conflicts and building economies. That's how we forged a trans-Pacific partnership to open markets and protect workers and the environment and advance American leadership in Asia. It cuts 18,000 taxes on products made in America which will then support more good jobs here in America. With TPP, China does not set the rules in that region. We do. You want to show our strength in this new century? Approve this agreement. Give us the tools to enforce it. The Trans-Pacific Partnership writes the rules for global trade and still needs congressional approval. The president also sees the restoration of domestic relations with Cuba opening new markets for American goods. Open the door to travel and commerce position ourselves to improve the lives of the Cuban people. Recognize that the Cold War is over. Lift the embargo. The president put Joe Biden in charge of mission control in curing cancer. Obama said the same level of commitment is needed in developing clean energy sources. If anybody still wants to dispute the science around climate change, have at it. You will be pretty lonely because you'll be debating our military, most of America's business leaders, the majority of the American people, almost the entire scientific community, and 200 nations around the world who agree it's a problem and intend to solve it. Obama cited 2014 and 2015 as the warmest years on record as the reason for American businesses to produce and sell the energy of the future. Seven years ago, we made the single biggest investment in clean energy in our history. In fields from Iowa to Texas, wind power is now cheaper than dirtier conventional power. On rooftops from Arizona to New York, solar is saving Americans tens of millions of dollars a year on their energy bills and employs more Americans than coal in jobs that pay better than average. 
And meanwhile, we've cut our imports of foreign oil by nearly 60 percent and cut carbon pollution more than any other country on Earth. Energy and environment were big topics, but missing was any direct reference to agriculture or ethanol. Obama did call for fixing a broken immigration system. The Republican response was delivered by South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley, who used her own personal narrative to soften the topic. My story is really not much different from millions of other Americans. Immigrants have been coming to our shores for generations to live the dream that is America. They wanted better for their children than for themselves. That remains the dream of all of us. And in this country, we have seen time and again that that dream is achievable. Congress may begin hearing on the Trans-Pacific Partnership next month. Leading U.S. commodity groups called the trade pact the biggest opportunity for U.S. agriculture in history, making American producers part of an economic counterweight to China. A variety of farm products would likely get a boost from the deal, but cotton stands to reap the most benefit. The soft good hasn't been a staple of the U.S. economy since the Emancipation Proclamation. But Asian TPP member nations would need to import massive quantities of raw cotton to make cheap clothing for new U.S. markets. Expanded demand comes at a good time for U.S. cotton producers, who have wrestled with several challenges in recent years. Colleen Bradford Krantz explains. Last spring, farmers reported planting 8.5 million acres of cotton, which, with the exception of one farm crisis year, was the smallest amount of land dedicated to the crop in nearly 150 years. If current trends continue, U.S. farmers could plant fewer acres to cotton in the spring than at any point since the Civil War. And while commodity market experts are not convinced this historic low is likely, federal data does illustrate the general downward trend in the cotton industry. And we talk about just the acres that were planted this year. They're down about 20 percent. It's the lowest area that we've had in the United States since 1983. Uh, and it, when you look regionally, you can look at the Mid-South, for example, the Delta region, and see some significant uh, declines in area, even going back over the last five or six years. What that is doing is that's, that's leading to a, a reduction in the number of gens, a reduction in the number of warehouses. Twenty years ago, the nation had roughly 1,300 active cotton gins used to separate lint and seed. As of 2014, only 601 were operating, a decline of more than 50 percent. This gin in Rector, Arkansas, has managed to hang on as dozens of others in the northeast corner of the state have closed. When I uh, started years ago in Craighead County, Arkansas, we had like 19 gins in that county, and now they're down to about four or five over the years' times. And the same thing is happening all over the nation. We had a million acres of cotton just a very few years ago in, in Arkansas, and we're down to 200,000. We've reduced 80 percent. Cotton yields, though generally improving over time, dipped 8 percent in the past decade to 768 pounds per acre. Overall annual production during that period dropped 45 percent to 13 million bales. And the ripple effect of declining cotton production can be felt on main streets throughout the 17 cotton-producing states. In December of last year, several cotton farmers traveled to Washington, D.C. to testify before a House of Representatives Agriculture Subcommittee about the hardships. The pipeline of cotton is not the only thing affected out in, in the cotton country. Uh, the mom and, especially mom and pop organizations within these, these rural communities are, are, are highly stressed right now. Cotton prices have been on a general downward trend since 2011 when they briefly topped $2 per pound. Prices hovered around 62 cents per pound as the new year began. If we had uh, input prices we did say five, ten years ago, well yeah, we, we could come along, we could go right on through this thing and keep going. It's about like driving down the road and throwing dollar bills out the window. Although the world's average annual cotton use has increased modestly in recent years, it has still been harmed by an overall shift toward greater use of man-made fibers. In addition, 
A lawsuit filed a decade ago by Brazil had asked the World Trade Organization to force the United States to stop subsidizing cotton farmers. The lawsuit led to cotton being taken off the list of commodities supported under the latest Farm Bill's programs, Agriculture Risk Coverage, or ARC, and Price Loss Coverage, or PLC. Although cotton farmers can buy into a government-backed insurance program called STAX, only about 30 percent have found it worth the investment when compared with other insurance options. Cotton situation is unique among commodities because we've been hit with significant changes in both market prices and farm program safety net. Cotton producers are by and large operating under a safety net that was never designed to address these dire circumstances. China and India, the only two countries producing more cotton than the United States, are operating with support from their own governments that U.S. farmers claim makes it difficult to compete in a global economy. The assistance often comes in the form of subsidized fertilizer or seed. Because those World Trade Organization member nations can label themselves as still developing, they are granted more latitude in terms of supports that might otherwise be deemed unfair in a developed nation such as the United States. In recent years, China built a government reserve of 50 to 60 million bales of cotton. Because of the huge stockpiles in China, the market doesn't know, are they available? Are they going to be made available? Are they going to be held off the market? Uh, it, it, it really is limiting our potential. Still, some analysts are more optimistic and believe the coming year could result in an uptick or at least an even year for cotton acres. Informa Economics, a commodity research company, estimates that farmers will plant 9.5 million acres of cotton, which would represent an 11 percent increase over last year. Farmers had intended to plant more cotton in 2015, but overly wet weather interfered with those plans in some states. If raising cotton no longer pencils out, equipment is one factor farmers must consider. Most producers have difficulty justifying leaving a $650,000 cotton picker sitting in the shed as they shift to another crop. And selling a picker with so many leaving cotton behind becomes a difficult task. Farmers who irrigate in drier regions might also struggle to find another crop that can use water as efficiently and handle drought as well as cotton. Cotton industry leaders have asked Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack to list cottonseed as an oilseed covered by the Farm Bill's ARC and PLC programs. Cottonseed, pressed to make oil or used as animal feed, accounts for about 17 percent of cotton revenue. I'm really so anxious about this cottonseed uh, program because I think, I mean, it's, it's the lifeblood of cotton. I mean, I think cotton's going to leave the United States if we don't get this. I really believe we're on the road to having that happen. And while the Environmental Working Group issued a subsequent press release saying the cotton industry was, quote, brazenly lobbying for an even sweeter arrangement, more than 100 U.S. representatives and senators signed letters asking Vilsack to support the proposal. It remains unclear whether Vilsack will list cottonseed oil as a covered commodity or whether he has the administrative authority to do so. Despite any wrangling on Capitol Hill, farmers will return to the fields in the spring. What they choose to plant in the majority of so-called cotton country remains to be seen. For Market to Market, I'm Colleen Bradford Krantz. Next, the Market to Market Report. A yield reduction in USDA's World Agricultural Supply and Demand forecast early this week led to a brief spike in the grain markets. Small grains continued to decline, but coarse grains and oil seeds built on the news. For the week, March wheat lost nearly a nickel, and the nearby corn contract gained over six cents. Despite running behind expectations, higher-than-expected exports helped boots boost the March soybean contract nearly 14 cents. March meal followed the trend, rising $2 per ton. In the softs, March cotton advanced one cent per hundredweight. The dairy parlor saw February Class Three milk futures jump 63 cents. Over in livestock, the February cattle contract lost 5.33, March feeders declined 7.05, and the February lean hog contract added 2.18. 
In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index gained four-tenths of a percent. Plummeting 20 percent in the first 10 trading days of 2016, February crude took it on the chin again this week to settle below $30 per barrel. COMEX Gold lost $7.20 per ounce, and the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index fell more than 21 points to settle at $2.79 even. Here now to lend us his insight on these and other trends is one of our regular market analysts, Don Rose. Don, welcome back. Thank you, Mike. Now, we did have the USDA, a lot of reports, out on Tuesday, and we saw wheat really take the lead after those reports came out. We saw winter wheat seedings down, and then it just faded. What happened in the wheat market this week? Well, you know, that January report is one of the big four reports. It's a, it's a market-moving report most of the years. This report was really, for the most part, a very quiet type of a um, uh, report. But the positiveness in the report was the acres report on winter wheat. Winter wheat acres were down 2.5 million, but the bad news is those acres are going to probably go to corn, soybeans, or milo. But, you know, we did give us a push to the upside technically just because we were oversold. We ran up into resistance, but then some of the pressure from the outside markets really pulled us back down. So for the week, we really didn't make a lot of headway. So that's the issue. Just too much wheat in the world market. The U.S. isn't really competitive. We're still 20 to 30 uh, cents out of the market. We have our captive markets, and that's about it. So same story. Uh, funds big shorts. I can't spook them uh, to the upside and too much grain in the U.S. and the world on the wheat. Now, for producers out there, if we can't hold a rally on a report like we saw this week, whoa, is there any upside out there potentially in the future? Well, I think we're going to have to have some uh, unknowns uh, that really come into the marketplace. And what you're really going to have to have is uh, we can't compete in the world market. I mean, we can't push up if the rest of the world's 20, 30 cents cheaper than we are. So you're going to have to have the world wheat values come up uh, for some reason. They, they can uh, muscle it up a little bit. That's what happened in the corn, and that's part of the reason we got a corn bounce this week is we did find world values move up. But for us right now, I think it's really the wheat come out of dormancy. If we have some issues in North America, then you can can have some weather concerns, but right now our wheat conditions are much better than they were last year, and so uh, I would have to say rallies, Mike, are probably more on new crop wheat, 5 to 510 are probably more selling opportunities than they are buying opportunities at the low end of the range. Okay. Now well, let's jump into this corn market. We did see a, a bump on the report. We managed to hold most of that. We're up six cents on the week. And, uh, talk to us a little bit about where this could go from here. Well, the corn market did have a good week, and I tell you, the grains in general really performed not all that bad. We had a lot of pressure this week, and I mean, we, we survived. Uh, crude oil was under a lot of pressure, as you indicated earlier in the story. We had the uh, equity markets just fell apart across the world. At the same time, you know, you really get a chance to see the dirty laundry when you see these pressures out here, because uh, do you spook the trade? The funds are huge shorts in the corn also, near record, about the same as they were last spring. But we moved up technically because the world market uh, came up. Argentina uh, prices came up this week. So we're back competitive at least for a few months. Our exports should pick up a bit. And I think, you know, frankly, the uh, U.S. producer not interested in selling at these levels. So the trick of this market is funds are big shorts. Uh, we don't really see a weather problem right now. Uh, a little bit of weather problem in uh, South America, Mato Grosso. They're starting to harvest beans. Uh, getting some rainy conditions, maybe slowing down the planting for the, uh, sec for the first crop uh, of corn, the double crop. But I think the resistance, Mike, really, in an oversold market is all we're doing, correct, in oversold. 365, 370 on nearby March corn's tough resistance. Funds come out for some reason, maybe you go to 380, but uh, in four, uh, 410 on D's corn. But for the most part, uh, you've got a market that is supply bearish, demand bearish, and uh, you need a weather market to push us to the upside, I'd say. Okay. Now, a lot of bearish news everywhere. And we've got a question here from one of our followers on Twitter. This is from Chris in Cuba City, Wisconsin. He's wondering, with crude oil making 12-year low this week, does that set the stage for corn and beans to attain their eight-year lows, 290 in corn and 788 in beans? Well, I tell you, he's, he's looking at it the same way we are at U.S. Commodities. Is we'd think that overall we're in a market that if if we don't have weather problems, if we get the acres, remember you're going to have probably two to three million corn acres more this next year, probably one to two million more soybean acres. Um, South America looks like they're going to have a big crop. 
If we don't have weather problems, exactly. We think that Dee's corn in uh, the fall is targeted 290 to 310. We think November beans are targeted 750 to 780. So uh, downside pressure. You don't like to hear those numbers, but when you have crude under 30, you have the dollar strong, uh, you have world competition. Um, we're not setting the bar anymore. We're 28% of the overall world trade for grain. So we're not the big elephant anymore like we were. All right. Well, now let's talk soybeans. Uh, soybeans up on the week, up 13 cents in the old crop bean. Any room to the upside there? Well, soybeans are much like the wheat and the corn. We've got the fund sitting here with massive short positions. Uh, you know, the producers are really not selling here in the U.S. The world markets have come up a bit. Uh, we again, you know, had a good trade this week. Uh, technically, we we survived the the big down in the uh, equity markets around the world, uh, the crude oil pressure, the biofuel pressure, and uh, the upside. I would say very much the same. What okay. you have is big overhead selling out of South America and the U.S. on soybeans. And remember, we've started the early harvest in Brazil. Our uh, exports are starting to uh, switch from the U.S. Uh, to China uh, right now. Mm -hmm. uh, our China switching over to the Brazil, South America crop. So um, upside's probably closer to 890 to 9 nearby beans, 9 to 910 on November beans. All right. Now let's talk cotton. We saw it move a penny this week. Any chance for further movement here in the short term? Well, we did have one positive thing develop on the cotton this week, and that was out of the, uh, the world uh, ending stocks figure on the January report. Did come down 5 million uh, uh, barrels, uh, bales, but it, it, a metric ton. But that's really not a, a game changer. It wasn't because of the demand picked up. It was more from uh, production came down in India, China, Pakistan. So those areas, uh, but uh, the growth area is really Vietnam. They're up 50% on their demand in four years. But cotton looks much like the other grains, probably a market that wants to sink down to closer to 55. Okay, speaking of sinking down, let's talk about these livestock markets. Live cattle, two weeks ago, we couldn't say enough positive things. Two weeks later, here we are retracing our steps to the downside. How far can this sell-off run? Well, the cattle market is a big swinging market, and it really makes you think you should have a lot of good tight risk management on because uh, the ulcers, uh, you know, show up pretty fast if you don't. The downside, uh, you know, there was a gap when we took off to the upside that we left on February cattle. 125.50 is the downside target. We're not that far away from that anymore. Uh, cash cattle this week, you know, didn't trade that bad. 134 in, uh, you know, in some of the feedlot areas. Uh, and it was really the box beef where it wasn't that bad this week. But I think it was more the feeling that uh, we're topping out in the cash, we're topping out in the uh, box beef. Uh, and we really showed how fragile the demand is because that's what this market was about this week. It was about the equity markets fell apart. Our demand uh, fear showed up and the market had a lot of liquidation. Now, this is typically when we get that box beef rally. Uh, we've seen it happen, happened yeah, very strong early in the month. Is this seasonally where we'd peak and begin to see that start to decline? That's what we're afraid of. The okay. box beef actually rallied 23% from the December lows. And so, you know, it kind of had its big peak up. Uh, we think we also put a seasonal top in the uh, cattle market unless we get some weather problems. Remember, the real support started in the cattle market when the uh, weather storms uh, started to develop. We took the uh, weights off of the cattle. We still kept the weights off, so that's a good news. All right. Now, on the feeder cattle market, we've got a lot of calves out there. We're going to be getting ready to get them marketed here to get this spring. Where do you see prices moving from here? Well, we think the feeder cattle market is very dependent on what happens to the price of corn, what happens to the uh, price of the live cattle. But overall, we think that the uh, feeder cattle market probably is much like the live cattle market. We think we're in a multi-year bear market, so we think rallies are more hedging opportunities, Mike, than anything else. Um, and we think that we'll probably have another two years to the downside. So. Um, I would I would get some risk management on uh, your fall calves. Do you still anticipate to see this herd growing all through 2015 and through 2016 as well? You know that's the problem. What we've done is we started the expansion, and uh, at a time when we probably don't need the expansion. So that's the real real issue. Our total beef production next year is going to grow about four percent from this last year. So whatever you had for prices this last year, think in terms of they could be a little bit lower next year. Okay. Now let's jump down into the lean hog market. We saw an increase, 218 higher this week. We've got a lot of a lot more production in that market, and prices still continue to slog upwards. Can that continue? 
the hog market really found some uh, support from the quarterly hog and pig report. It was a positive report, but really it wasn't a game changer. You know, what it really did is it pushed the futures market up, but the cash market really hasn't followed. Um, when you look at it, we're still going to have 2% more hogs than a, a year ago, so it, that's not a problem. You're still going to have about 3% total uh, red meat and poultry uh, supplies over a year ago. So. The hogs technically are positive, they're overbought, they're into some resistance zones, 78 to 82 on June hogs is a tough area to get through. And uh, you know if we get through that, then maybe 82 to 86, but uh, definitely I would be afraid of the fall hogs. We have a lot of production coming at us. Uh, the last time we had a similar production going from the second to third quarter was in 1998. Those were some big low prices in 2009, so proper risk management should be put in place. Okay, so on the upside, what were your targets there for the upside hogs? Well, I, 78 to 82 is a good level. Uh, and then if we get through that, 82 to 84, but uh, I think if you move past that you know is probably uh, for some other reasons under than the fundamentals and you don't have to get to those areas either those are tough resistance areas Mike okay all right now before we let you go we've seen this dollar start to sort of climb a little bit higher are you in the camp that sees this dollar climbing throughout 2016 well, here's the scary thing, Mike, is the last time we were in similar situations like this was in the mid-80s. In the mid-80s, the dollar went to 160, and so uh, crude oil went to $10. So when you're looking at similar years, you know, the dollar at 100, there's still room to the upside. All right. Well, Don, thanks so much for joining us this week. Thank you, Mike. Don Rose, thanks so much. That wraps up this broadcast portion of Market to Market, but we will continue our discussion and answer more of your questions in the Market Plus segment available on our website. While you're there, check out our social media channels. Also, we encourage you to take a closer look at the exclusive Market to Market Classroom. This online library lets you look back at our coverage of the business, technology, and science of agriculture. Be sure to let your local vocational ag teacher know about this free classroom service. And join us again next week when we'll explore how farmers are enlisting old techniques to round up super weeds. So until then, thanks for watching. I'm Mike Pearson. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa Public Television, which is solely responsible for its content. Funding for Market to Market is provided by Grinnell Mutual. You think differently about a customer when you stand in the middle of his dreams. We work to make sure you get covered right. Grinnell Mutual, a policy of working together. Information on finding an agent near you is available at GrinnellMutual.com.